And uh, this uh, particular talk is going to be on the value of civic indicators to a community, making the case. So over the next 90 minutes, the, this workshop and case study will present a business case for using civic indicators while providing answers to such timely questions as why should a community invest in measuring quality of life and how would a community function without this effort? So the essence of this session is to gain a better understanding of the real value of civic indicators, who benefits and how. So your present presenter this afternoon is Mr. Rob Coleman, a research officer with the Commun Community Quality Institute. So to get the things started, please join me in welcoming Mr. Rob Coleman. Hi everyone, how are you doing? Tired, okay, cool. Um, I have to make a whole bunch of uh, introductory remarks because I'm new to CQI, the organization I work for, so I need to make some declarations. I'm new to civic indicators, so I hope that I'll be able to answer all of the questions that you may have for me, but my background is in political science. I went to Laurentian to do my BA, and I went to Waterloo to do my MA, and my entire background is political. So this whole idea of civic indicators is new to me, which hopefully this will be a good exercise to sort of solidify my understanding of it, but also to tell you basically the story of my organization, uh, which is CQI. I'm a research officer, but actually I just became the manager because our executive director got seconded to the Northern Growth Plan, which is the strategy for Northern Ontario that the government is introducing. Some of you may be aware of it. Um, can I just see by show of hands anyone who is from Sault Ste. Marie? Anyone know where Sault Ste. Marie is? Okay. Good. Okay, well, if you know where it is, you know our basic challenge, um, and that's our geography. Because we're, basically, for those of you who don't know, we're, I guess, we're just west of Sudbury and the last city before Thunder Bay in northern Ontario, which um, is easy to say, but we're actually three and a half hours from Sudbury and another eight to Thunder Bay. And that's all just in northern Ontario. So geography is our big challenge. So when we talk about quality of life, you'll hear me, you'll hear me say things about geography often. So... Thank you, first of all, for coming uh, and listening to me. Number, uh, yeah, my second sort of caveat is that I'm not a business person. Sorry if I'm in the way. Um, so this isn't really a business case at all. Am I like right in the way? Um, but you'll see, you'll see why I call it a business case. Um, because we are a, a research organization funded by a municipality who is you know, a bunch of city councillors who think a certain way. So we've had to make the business case for quality of life. So that's kind of interesting. I'm going to apologize in, in advance, too, for my PowerPoint skills. So the, my organization that I belong to is called CQI, Community Quality Institute. OK, so that's us. But I'm sure you guys are aware of the term CQI, as in continuous quality improvement. Those are two different things. And I'll probably confuse them a lot. Um, but this is something that we do. We're interested in the process of CQI. But keep in mind that I'm from the organization Community Quality Institute. OK. So what are we? What do we do? All that kind of stuff. So Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. We were created out of. Um, a municipal uh, engagement process with the community called BEC. It was, it was uh, becoming an extraordinary community. That's way before my time. But what they said basically is that they want to engage the community to develop our community. And they want to make decisions based on evidence and based on the data that they had available to them. So out of that BEC process, becoming an extraordinary community, um, CQI was developed. So originally, we were just a department in the municipality of Sault Ste. Marie. So I wrote this uh, thinking that you guys would be municipality people. So we originally started as um, a municipal organization, and we still are, but we've since moved because there was a lot of potential for 
partnerships with Sioux College, um, which is the local college and, and the university, but we, we share resources with Sioux College in terms of the research we do and stuff. The main thing that we're responsible for doing is publishing the community performance report. So this is where the civic indicators come to play. It's basically a report on how our community is doing, on the, the quality of life in Sault Ste. Marie. So that's kind of interesting. Okay, so we do two things. We do the report, but we also do training. Because we're in Sault Ste. Marie, it's very difficult to have access to quality training on CQI methods. So things like, um, you know, quality assurance programs and outcome measurement and um, all, all those kind of things that you probably have easy access to here, we don't. So we have to bring people in here, like we bring people from NQI and StatsCan. For example, I just had a StatsCan guy come in. We get all different people from different organizations, the municipality, private or industry, um, you know, people from the colleges and stuff. And he'll do a presentation on how to use StatsCan data. So we do, on one side, reporting. On the other side, training. So StatsCan is nice because it's free. They don't charge us anything for the trainer to come up and give workshops on how to use their data. Um, but for more advanced things, there is a cost involved. And so what we do is we pool our resources together. We pool private industry and social services, and we offer the training. So it's affordable, and we can pay for them to come up to St. Marie. OK, so we're a research organization funded by the city. So if you know about municipalities in northern Ontario, you know that that's kind of amazing, because the budgets are small. And you really have to make the case um, to, to be funded by a municipality. There's a lot of demands and not a lot of money. We do have other, we have membership as well. We do research to try and help with costs. We do research about Northern Ontario, and we do research for other associations in my community. OK, and how do we, how do, we do um, the community performance report? Is by task forces. And this is um, something I'll talk about a little bit about later. So what we do is we go out and meet with people in the different sectors. It's, uh, this is part of our engagement process. So if we want to write a community, community, sorry, community performance report about, say, one section's on the economy, well, we meet with the Economic Development Corporation, and we meet with the major economic drivers, like SR Steel, for example, a big steel company in Sault Ste. Marie. So we have people from all these different sectors to come and talk to us, and that's how we write each section of the report. From this report, we do a gap analysis. So the report is a quality of life report, so it measures all different kinds of things in different sectors, health, education, uh, culture and recreation, uh, governance, environment, and so forth. So we meet with a lot of different people, and it's only a staff of two. I'm one of them, and I'm here. So it's difficult, but this is what we do. I'll get to gap analysis later. OK, this is uh, an anecdote from my thesis advisor who said, Presentations are not good mystery novels, so get to the point right away. So I'm going to do that. So this is the argument for civic indicators in four easy steps. Basically, and this is how we made our, our argument, communities are in competition with each other, especially in the north. We need people. And every, all these little northern cities need people. But you know, even huge, huge cities need people. That's fine. It's not just about the jobs, too. People are interested in quality of life. If we measure it, this is quality of life, we can improve it. That's another argument that we're making. You can accept or reject it. And the final one is these civic indicators that we help create provide a method of CQI, and that's continuous quality improvement for a community's quality of life. So those are, those are the four points that really solidify how we made our case to the municipality that measuring quality of life is actually worth it for them. Because one of the biggest problems in Sault Ste. Marie is attracting highly skilled, qualified people. OK. So I'm going to go through them. How do we make this argument to them? 
And the first, the first thing you always do is, you know, get out your stats can data and say, look at the trends, right? Canada is getting older. So we've seen an 11.5% increase in the 65 pluses. And that's, you know, just raw data. Of, of the growth that we see, so that represents a significant sort of outflow of human resources too, right? People just retiring and stuff. Uh, and the growth rate for Canada, 5.2%, is interesting because two-thirds of this comes from immigration. In the United States, though, 60% of their 5% growth comes from within. So they're making babies. Uh, so, but that represents a really interesting you know, fact for us. People are coming to Canada. They get that there's a good quality of life here. Um, and we need to understand that, especially as a municipality. Where are they coming to? Hint, it's not Sault Ste. Marie. <laughs> True, they're going to large urban centers, right? So it's great that people are coming here, but how do we get them? Or how does anyone get them? How does a municipality get them? So the, the basic point of this is that a municipality is in competition. It's certainly in the north, we're all in competition for human resources, but the north is in competition with the south, particularly the GTA. Um, so we'll talk about how we, how we manage that challenge. OK, so is, is it even OK to say a community is a business? This is how we've made the case, just, just to let, let you know. This is just sort of an exercise in thinking. And it's another way of us saying a community is holistic. Like, like a business. Remember, we, we make our case to city councillors, so you have to know your audience. Um, so keep that in the back of your mind. Because for me, th this is counterintuitive. A community is not like a business. <laughs> it's something different. But we have to make our arguments. So we have their, our separated sectors, economic, health, environment, the social services, education. And we understand them as the separate parts of a business. And I guess, you know, there's the corporate speak stuff like synergy and stuff like that. They all, they all have to work together. And that's, that's the case that we made to our municipality. So let's just see what the next slide is because I forget. Right. If we're selling quality of life, and the people are the customers, what is it that they're buying, I guess you could say? And so here we have some pretty basic points. They want a healthy environment. How do we measure it? Low crime, amount of violence, and so forth. They want access to natural spaces. We hope they do, because we have it in Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, but green is, is generally in. I don't need to tell you people. Um, positive social interaction. Now, this is something that's interesting among the sort of Richard Florida school. Um, they've done a lot to really talk about social interaction, which is a very difficult thing to try and um, capture in terms of making an indicator for how tolerant is your community. Sometimes you don't want to know. Um, opportunities for creative expression. That's another interesting thing. So those are just some, some of the many, many points um, that we think of when we think of quality of life. And so how do we develop these assets? And this is where the CQI comes in. Continuous quality improvement. So we plan, we check, we do, all that kind of stuff. OK. So Sault Ste. Marie is a steel town. Well, it was. Still is. It's our biggest industry. So the, the idea of CQI, or quality assurance, where you constantly check that's sort of that's a done deal in manufacturing. Like the return on investment for a CQI program in manufacturing is self-evident. You know, you see your increased sales or you see reduced material or labor costs or whatever it is. But a civic indicator program is not so easy to capture the return on investment. And when you make the case to a municipality, if you want more funding, for example, or whatever, it's it's quite difficult. Because the benefits are in the future, for sure. 
at least we suggest they are, it's not supposed to be a direct return on investment. It's supposed to help you plan. And that's, it's very challenging to, to make the argument to a municipality that it's worthwhile to fund this. So, I mean, the point here is that the civic indicators are really just one piece of a community development process. And that's, that's what we try to sort of demonstrate to our municipality with some success. I have the funny thing here. So we are the check portion. If this is municipal planning, we hope that we're the check portion. Because what we do is provide data in the various sectors that they create policy for. Um, we, we hope, we just, we met with the city not, not too long ago to say, you know, how often does our report come into your planning process? Like, are you using this? Some people do. Some people have read it, which was great. Some people um, read the section that pertains to the planning process that they're engaged in, and some people hadn't heard of it. These are counselors. So, I mean, that, that represents the, the problem both for us in terms of how we can communicate our data better and how we can engage um, municipal government better. And it's, it's, it's a challenge. So, this is also why I'm here because I want to sort of engage you you guys in helping us <laughs> come, up, come up with better ways of, of doing this. So if you have any comments, I would definitely like to hear them. Okay, so of the business case, the modern world's mobile and people are coming here. It's not just about the jobs, they want a high quality of life. We are definitely in fierce competition for human resources. We as in the municipalities. And our civic indicators measure and help improve the quality of life. OK. So that was the case that we made. Now I just want to tell you about sort of a little bit more about what we do in the Sioux. OK. So this is a typical Sault Ste. Marie shot. A, a snowstorm, we get tons and tons of lake effect snow. We're in the middle of the Great Lakes, so we get dumped on. Uh, open spaces, and it's freezing cold, really cold. This is, I picked this picture on purpose because it's a great sort of perceptual representation of what a lot of people think of when they think of the Sioux. This is a challenge. Okay. So here is the process that we undertake. I'll get, I'll get back to that perceptual problem. But here is the process that we undertake in terms of writing our community performance report. So these are the task forces that we set up. The SDOH is the Social Determinants of Health. That's something we've introduced to try and help um, guide the task forces to creating indicators that get a really good grasp on uh, reality, I guess, um, which is an awful thing to say, but true nonetheless. So because the, the interesting thing is the task forces create the indicators for our report. We don't do it. I know that's, I know that's weird, but it it's, relies on their data and their thinking because this is, remember, first of all, a community engagement process. It's sort of their thinking that comes up with what do we need to measure? What does it tell us about Sault Ste. Marie? So we meet with all of them. They give us data, for, for example. And we, do, we publish it in a report. We do you know, some analysis and so forth. And then from there, we see where the gaps are. Well, hopefully the data reveals the gaps. And from the gap analysis, we create action plans, which we forward to the municipal government. We also do, um, if we identify a strange uh, gap, we'll do a smaller report, like we just did one on the external costs of poverty, uh, which is basically, the thesis was, if you, don't, if you don't fund 
I guess, the harm reduction side of poverty. If you don't fund it at its early stages, you end up paying for it anyways, in different ways. So healthcare costs, lost productivity, and so forth. So that was just a, a small report that we saw that we had the data for and thought, why not, why not do? So we partnered with the social services and released a, a small report, which was kind of cool. So it's a staff of two. Um, me and one other person who does most of the professional development stuff, so lots of the training. And then the community, of course, because each one of the task forces is made up of members, practitioners, just sometimes really interested activists um, who come in. The meetings are open to the public, and we talk about the quality of life indicators, uh, what they tell us about the quality of life in Sault Ste. Marie, and the gaps, what we need to do. Okay, so here's a fun little project that we did. We have to make the sell to people um, that Sault Ste. Marie has a great quality of life. One of the ways that we do that, we have to capitalize on what we're good at. You talk about housing costs. So one of our postcards, for example, has a house in Sault Ste. Marie that you can get for $200,000. And the, the really bad quality of this, you can't quite tell, but that's sort of like a little townhouse somewhere, I think, in Brampton or something. So what this does is, is demonstrate one of our strengths, right? That's an affordable investment. This is a quality of life issue for some people. What does your money get you? So now this, this is um, one that often comes up. I think that's the 401. Or, or anywhere down here, yeah, you're right. I don't know. But this is a very typical sort of picturesque Sault Ste. Marie pick. Um, so that's, that's another area that, so we, we took the quality of life data, and these are basically for the municipal, um, it's a municipal project to, uh, what is it? I can't remember what the project was called. Ah, physician recruitment, of course. We have trouble getting doctors. We try and we try to get doctors to come to St. Marie. Uh, and one of the ways that we're trying to do that is to demonstrate the high quality of life. This is one of those ways. Okay. What else should I talk about? I do want to, I want a lot of time for questions. I um, just want to see what else I have. OK, I'll tell you about where we are now. So the process is the community performance report process. I know it must be sound weird. Um, it's iterative, right? So each year we go through and we try and collect data so that we can see trends and identify things about our community. So where are we now? We're just at the stage because we just started doing this report for the last two years. So we're at the stage where we can really um, sort of go forward and identify gaps. Because it's, it's not easy after just having one year of collected data uh, to see where you are in terms of quality of life for your community. So after am amassing a certain amount of data over the years, you can sort of say, OK, here's where we are, and here's where we want to be. One of the things we didn't want to do was um, always be comparing, because that's, that's sort of um, a trend in, in, in the research in the north. Like, get a, a whole bunch of small cities, like it'll be Sault Ste. Marie, North Bay, Sault Ste. Marie, Timmins, and then just measure everything and see how we compare. We wanted just to focus on ourselves uh, and say, you know, this is how we're doing. So now is the time where I hope I can make things a little clearer. If you have questions, I know the, the process must be, sound a little weird to you. So I'd like to open it up to questions. I was wondering what the split of your data is. Uh, like how much is proprietary and you collect directly and how much you source from other places. And then perhaps 
part of that answer uh, <laughs> will answer this, my second question, which okay. is your uh, budget on a, in an average year. That's a good question. Uh, I'll answer the data question. Um, oh, we try and get it wherever we can. You know, that's another challenge of, of uh, living in a community in the north. Like, when I went to Waterloo, it was crazy easy um, to, to find really good data, or I had access to it as a student there. Finding really good data in the north is really hard. Finding research about northern Ontario is very difficult. Um, so that's why we have the task forces. Basically, we ask them to come in with the data. Um, if it's something that they don't want to reveal, I know they, they're in part uh, responsible for the data. Part of it, we have a community data plan where we all pool together and purchase um, like StatsCan data at a lower level that we can access. So most of it comes from, if it's sort of statistics about education, the, someone from the school board will sit on our task force and provide that data to us. If it's something more difficult, we try and, uh, we try and pay for it. Our budget's very small. The, the process, we meet monthly, these task forces. And if there's changes, I mean, they collect the data, right? So if there's changes, we record it. Um, and if there's a gap that they want to identify, then we, we start changing. We start writing something different. Um, but yeah, it's monthly meetings. So you're having, it sounds like you're having great success in all task force bringing data forward. Is that, are there some that don't? No. Uh, did it sound like there was great success? <laughs> okay. Well, let me talk about the problems then. The problems are that we rely on participation. Like, what a great idea, right? But um, I'll invite 20 people to a task force meeting, and if I get 10 to show up, that's amazing. You know? So it's, it's important that uh, I have to constantly be out there, um, meeting with people, reminding them about um, the value of the work. Um, Participation is always a challenge for us. Uh, we try and come up with you know, clever ways to engage people. It's difficult. Um, plus, you know, there's been a huge sort of like, last year for sure, there was a, like a budget crunch. And people's time got really restricted in terms of like, this is their work time too, that they, we meet during the day. So a lot of people's work time got restricted to extracurriculars, I guess you could call this. And, and so that was a, it's become a challenge for us even still now, just engaging people for sure. I got two questions. The Sault Ste. Marie Innovation Center, yes. which does all the mapping and does the community type questions. What relationship have you got with that? We're, they're our biggest partner. Yeah, because it's, it's really impressive from an outsider to look at what Sault Ste. Marie has now been capable of doing mm -hmm. um, and the relationship that it then has with Nipissing that mm -hmm. has spawned um, job creation and, and some really innovative pieces. So that would be the question about the city and the relationship with the independent uh, innovation center, which I understood had been housed as a municipal initiative, but learned from that to become independent, question number one. Okay. One, and then would be, how is your approach different from the community observatory model? I'm not, you'd have to familiarize me with the community observatory um, Buffalo model. community observatory, the, now the Niagara community observatory, their research units um, that I think, um, you know, seek to, to investigate local, mm -hmm. um, economic, environment, social uh, issues? Uh, well, I'm not qualified to answer that because I just don't know enough about that process. I'm intensely interested, though, because I'm, I'm new at this, right? So I'm going to talk to you later for sure about that because I want to know more. Um, and my background isn't in this, right? So if you want to talk about politics, right on. But. So that's my background. So coming to this is a little, di little difficult for me. Um, your first question about the Innovation Center, which I also can't speak about, but I'll, you know, with, with any authority, but it's, it's still municipally funded, but it's a technology incubation center. So as well as, you know, development. Um, so yeah, I, I know 
they do a lot in terms of helping with the, the data strategy and the maps. Like that's how we were able to access how far away bus stops were to events because they could do that. They did that for yeah, you. definitely. So Susan, one of the great things about the Sioux is that it is so small. Like I can get everyone from social services to come have a meeting with me because it's two people. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, but they'll show up, right? And, and that's fantastic. Imagine trying to do it. Like, you guys are laughing, but that's how it works. Uh, you know, it'd be impossible probably anywhere else. You said earlier about uh, communities having to compete now for uh, people. Mm -hmm. uh, your data, do you compare it with other communities in Ontario or across Canada? Well, we stay away from that, as I said before. Um, first, because we... Um, we have to be careful. We ask our, our community to provide us the data. So sometimes it's something peculiar and internal to an organization, but tells us about our community. If it's like a big uh, industry and they're releasing information to us, um, it's also not something that would traditionally be compared. Uh, so there are those kind of concerns. But also, one of the things we do that is different, that's sort of an attempt at community engagement too, is we do what are called community cafes. So if we identify something like the last one we had was on water quality, for example. So in our environmental task force, we measure water quality. And it turns out, wow, this has great water quality. So we wanted to sort of, it's not just about where we are. We also want to celebrate good things. And so part of that is we have these cafes. And we brought in a speaker. It was a speaker on the, a guy from Walkerton who talked about his experience going through that and how important it is to measure water quality and when what you know what are the consequences of not having a rigorous measurement system in water quality um, so we have these community cafes to try and engage the public and I was surprised so that's that's something I thought no one would show up to you know it was a Wednesday night you're gonna go to a thing on water quality I don't know but for like you know 45 people showed up so it was interesting and they weren't just like the water quality geeks I guess you could say so how, what kind of information are you getting? Are you getting it from other organizations, from universities? Uh, is there anything in the area of citizen science going on to help you with that side? And uh, I'm also, well, you did already answer one of my other questions about engagement and volunteer time, and it sounds like that is very challenging. I was, I really like the process in your, in your model. Um, when you talk about gaps, I was starting to get a little bit confused. I was thinking you were talking about data gaps, but no, it's... Quality of life gaps, yeah. Yeah, so Sorry, it's, it's actually understand. sort of a gap between what your indicator is showing and where you want to be, is that... Right, because yeah. we think of us as the process, not the report, so... Okay. So I guess I'm only left with that first question, where you're getting really... Uh, sort of physical data like water quality, air quality, um, do you have anything on biodiversity? Maybe we can talk offline too if you, if you want. Uh, we measure um, the amount of electricity usage we get from the PUC. Um, what else do we get? Water usage. So this, I, I don't know what you mean by, uh, was it citizen science or something? Oh, uh, that is where you have citizens uh, through, uh, there are programs that are out there, but uh, some have kind of petered away with lack of funding, but uh, where you have a group of maybe a school or a, a community group go out and actually with test tubes and take measurement samples of water and take measurements and record them and put them down and do it regularly and end up you know, monitoring a, uh, a watershed or whatever, right. or uh, there's the Nature Watch program where people can track uh, frogs, earthworms, um, and then there's the very long-lasting uh, bird, Christmas bird count kind of thing. Which, okay. So there's quite a few things out there that might give you some, some background data or okay. baseline data. Yeah, I'm, but, not, I'm not aware of whether those exist, they, but I will say that our environmental task force has the most participation from just regular people. 
I guess I, I just remembered another question. Do you, you mentioned a cafe and do you, do you present your information and maybe I'll, I just need to look at your report, but with charts and data tables and that kind of thing, do you get that, do you, people pick up on that or is it yeah. kind of going over people's heads? And that, that, was, that was my, I mentioned my first problem is how we communicate this data because um, the report has, has, like, how else can you present it? You, we have graphs. Uh, we have tables of data. I mean, it's, it's um, the community cafes are a way that we can pick up on one, something that's interesting and make it public and make it more accessible, I guess, um, and, and engaging. Uh, so we try and bring a speaker in who, who's got something to do with it, right? Because you're right, um, how many... Unless you're really interested, you're not going to read this report, you know, and it's just, I don't know how accessible it is. You'll have to be the judge. Have any programs, policies, services changed as a result? Well, the, bu the bus route's changed, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, now, that may seem insignificant, but, um, I mean, we hope that this work identifies problems and helps the planning process for the municipality, right? And to that extent, it did. I mean, um, I'm also new, so I don't know what happened last year as a result of, of things. Um, so I can only speak to that specific example because I know there was an outcome. Uh, I'm not sure, but I know that part of my focus is really thinking of new ways to sort of communicate this to city councillors and, and make it uh, more of a useful document. Um, my question was related to that. Is there an overarching vision that is driving the process? So just to follow up on your answer, is there a way or is there an attempt to integrate the visions from the seven different task forces and connect it to the decision makers, which in this case is council in part? Mm -hmm. And a related question I had, I don't know if the Sioux has an integrated um, community sustainability plan that is developed under the gas tax program, and if it does, how these two initiatives are, are connected. I don't know about that. I couldn't, can't speak to that because I don't actually work now at the city of Sault Ste. Marie. Um, I know who to talk to, though, <laughs> so I can find that out. But, um, sorry, what was the first question again, too? It was... How do you connect? See, and this is, so again, I'm going to repeat myself that one of our problems is engaging city councillors um, and, and, and city planners. It's one of our problems, but it's also a success because some of them sit on our task force. Like we measure the amount of recycled material that the municipality recycles. And they provide us that data and, you know, they're happy to do it. So, I mean, it's... It's a double-edged sword, I guess. You know, sometimes they're, and that'll be sort of one guy who does it and is happy to participate. But when we go to council, if we make a pre presentation, we don't get to sit there when they deliberate or make their own decisions afterwards. You know what I mean? It's it's difficult. Um, you mentioned that your community task force or partners identify the gaps. Is there a survey tool that they've developed to identify these gaps, or how are they doing this? I'm just wondering about the methodology behind this. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, I can only speak, I've only met with them uh, once now, right? So I'm just, and it was sort of like an introduction. I don't know what methodology they used in terms of traditional research methods. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I think what they do is they know the problems before they come in. Sometimes. Um, or they think they know the problems. Yeah, sometimes they think they know, and then we measure, and it's different. Um, so that's, yeah. Yeah, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure exactly how that works just yet, just to be honest. I'm also interested if anyone wants to share what you do uh, in terms of if you use the Civic Indicators Program and what your experiences are. I don't know if anyone feels like sharing. More as a, a comment in that regard, um, I don't. I see it perhaps as less of a challenge than, than youth can be a significant uh, driver of change and participatory action. Um, and it it seems to me that if you're having difficulty, especially engaging 
uh, perhaps the adult population, maybe you need to come at it from, from down below because quite often children uh, and youth uh, can, can push uh, the importance and the significance of something that parents may not have time to mm -hmm. look into um, for whatever time constraints they have or, or resource constraints or whatever. So certainly going out and engaging uh, the younger populations through the schools and the educational system, including the, the university, uh, could, could significantly help your, uh, your community mm. engagement uh, sure. uh, profile. That's, uh, if I'll, I'll just tell you quickly, one of the, the engagement challenges that I'm very unhappy with youth representation. That's something I brought up before uh, and something I'm uh, working on. And also Aboriginal engagement. Uh, we have no Aboriginal people on any of our task forces. Uh, and we've found it difficult to you know, increase engagement. I mean, it's, it's, it's a challenge for us. Yeah. Um, I, my name is Christine Morgan. I'm with Indian and Northern Affairs, so I can perhaps speak to that a little bit. Uh, in that one of the, one of the big drawbacks with uh, trying to engage the Aboriginal population is that when we go out, we go out to them and we tell them and this, that, and the next thing, mm -hmm. and they're not interested. We've been telling them for century, for decades, for for a hundred years. Right. They're tired of us telling them because um, they're not interested in what what we have to say. Right. They have more to say in terms of sustainable development and sustainability than, than we can even imagine. So really they want to be engaged but in a listening uh, capacity and that we're listening to them. So approach is a very important uh, aspect in engaging mm -hmm. the local uh, Aboriginal population. Well, I think I might need to talk to you later then. Sure. And kids as well, it, 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 the same oh, yeah. thing. Yeah. Well, there's a few of you I'd like to chat with after this is over, if you don't mind. Um, but other than that, thanks very much uh, for listening. And.